All right. John chapter 6, looking this morning at the first 29 verses, and the title of our message is Jesus Feeds the 5,000. Uh, we told you earlier that the Apostle John only records for us the events that are crucial to his purpose, and then we told you what that purpose is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And the feeding of the 5,000 is one of those crucial events. It's the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded by all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And out of all of the miracles that Jesus performed, none was quite as public as this one. None were ever performed before so many eyewitnesses. And this particular particular miracle sort of piqued the people's messianic expectations. But after this miracle, many who had previously been following Jesus actually turned away from him and no longer followed him. And we'll see why. But in verse one, after these things, chapter five, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee. That's its Jewish name, which is the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Roman name. From the other Gospels, we know that Jesus actually went to a place near Bethsaida. That'll be important here in a moment on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Then a great multitude followed him, and notice carefully, because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. So Jesus is now about a year away from the cross. His ministry has been going on for now two and a half years. Huge crowds have been following him. Uh, everywhere he went, mostly because of the miracles and the healings. Back in chapter 2, in verse 23, remember, it said he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, and many believed in his name when they saw the signs, which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And we're told in verse 2 that the reason many of them were following him was because of the miracles that he was performing. And so most of these people actually failed to see who Jesus actually was. He was the promised Messiah. He was the Son of God. And most of them saw in him a wonderful magician, a clever physician, if you would, that could heal the sick. But they failed to see that Jesus was the Messiah. He's the Son of God, the one that had come to save them from their sins. They were blind to his divine glory. They were following him for all of the wrong reasons, simply for the entertainment and for the convenience of having a physician near them all the time. And I thought, do you think there might be people like that today who are coming for all the wrong reasons? And of course, uh, there are. Very few saw Jesus as anything more than just a wonderful teacher, a miracle worker. And we have uh, those same kinds of people today, the, the curiosity and maybe sometimes even the excitement of the crowds. But Jesus, being God in human flesh and knowing what was in the hearts of all men, was not fooled by those that were following him. And Jesus, verse 3, went up on a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. He would rather have been with that small group of his disciples, that 12 men, than to be surrounded by thousands of those who were following him for the wrong reasons. And that ought to pique our interest. If we're genuinely followers of him, followers of him, then we need to stay close to him. But he would often take his disciples away privately, and on many occasions, Jesus himself would sneak away even from them to a deserted place to pray alone. And that's where Jesus and his disciples sought their refreshment, away from the crowds of people, close to God the Father praying. Where do you get away from the crowds, or do you? How do you uh, retreat from the cares of this life and from, the, from everything that grabs our attention? And it's good that we at times do the same thing that they did, to spend some much-needed time away from the crowds and with those who believe in Jesus, but there's also times that we need to get with God alone. And then the miracles, they certainly drew multitudes after him, but they only drew a few to him. There's a difference and now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And that tells us a couple of things. That it was now a year away from the cross. It was at the next, it'll be at the next Passover that he's going to be crucified. And that there were multitudes of people traveling from all over the Roman Empire through Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. So the crowds would be huge. 
And then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, not just the crowds that had been following him, but add to that the many travelers that were coming uh, from the north going south to Jerusalem for the Passover. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, there's a reason why that he asked Philip, because Philip was from the town of Bethesda where, where they were now near a deserted place right outside of Bethesda. And if any one of the disciples knew where they might get supplies to feed all these people, it would have been Philip. But this he said to test him, for he knew himself what he would do. Jesus really didn't uh, need Philip's input because he knew what he was going to do. But I like this about Jesus. Though there are crowds following him and they're following him for the wrong reasons, still he has compassion for them and their need. In fact, he's moved to do something about it because of compassion for them, he's going to feed them. But before he feeds them, he wants his disciples to know that there are not enough resources in any of the towns surrounding them. And even if there were, they didn't have enough money to purchase all that they needed. He wanted his disciples to know that they were in an absolutely impossible position and that they themselves could do nothing about it. You, you think that from time to time Jesus might put us in those kinds of situations? You bet he does. Just to show us that we're absolutely helpless, that we can do nothing, but that he can do everything. Now, the other gospels tell us that the disciples actually told Jesus to send the people away. Let them fend for themselves. And in their wildest imaginations, disciples didn't know how in the world all these people could possibly be fed. And I thought to myself, boy, they're just like us, aren't they? <laughs> Philip, where shall we buy food that all these may eat? How, how are we going to feed them? And he asked the question, not because he didn't know what he was going to do, but he did this to test Philip, to test his faith. And notice what Philip says. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have even a little. And 200 denarii is probably what Jesus and disciples had in the treasury at the time. It was traveling money. But that every one of them may have even just a little. And as it's going to turn out, every single one of them is not just going to have a little bit, but they're going to eat until they're past full. And so the disciples, they're in an impossible situation. And even if they could find enough food in the, the surrounding towns and villages, and they couldn't, they didn't have enough money to do so. And one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad, a little boy here, who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but notice, but... See, it's possible for us to limit Jesus because we, we, we put him in the same box that we're in. But what are they among so many? Andrew had probably heard Jesus uh, ask Philip where they could buy enough bread to feed all of these people. So he began to search for himself to find out what they might have. He also came up empty. Five barley loaves, two small fish, but what are these among so many? And what happened to Philip and what happened to Andrew is what happens to us as believers. Things come our way that are impossible for us to take care of, for which we don't have any resources for, that we come up short in trying to take care of. And we're asking ourselves, what, what in the world are we going to do in this situation? And these are God's testings of our faith. But he himself knows what he's going to do. He knows it all along. And aren't you glad that he has compassion on us, that he's willing to take us through those difficult times in order to teach us and feed us, even when we lack faith and trust in him. And these things are done to test us. But before he knows himself what he's going to do, they realized the situation they were in. They looked at the difficulty of the situation and not at the Lord. Have you been there? Have we formed the habit of instinctively turning to Jesus Christ for the need and for the answers? What, what, what is our feebleness compared to his compassion and ability to meet that need? And so we need to look daily to Jesus in faith, resting on his promise. The one that Paul reiterated in Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all of your need. 
Someone said this, that the birds without barn or storehouse are fed. Are fed. Uh, from them, let us learn to trust him for our bread. It's such a simple concept, but it makes every difference in the world, whether we look at an opportunity and see a difficulty, or we look at a difficulty and see an opportunity, an opportunity for the Lord to help us and to stretch our faith. He himself knew what he would do, but he wanted them, first of all, to realize the difficulty of the situation that they were in, the difficulty of it, so that their faith in him would be built up. They were not looking upward. They were looking outward. They'd been with him now for two and a half years. They they had seen miracle after miracle, but they're just like us. And then Jesus said, make the people sit down. What patience the Lord has with our unbelief. There's a lot of things that we can't do as believers, but we can still obey him. Amen? Amen. It's a simple request. Even though disciples, their faith failed, they could still do what Jesus asked them to do. And so can we. Make the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. That tells us something else. It's springtime in Galilee. Uh, The psalmist in Psalm 23 said, uh, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. And so they're all sitting down on this lush, long, green grass. The men sat down in number about 5,000. This would be as many as 25,000 in total because the Jewish families in would normally have three to four children. You're talking about wives and children. You're talking closer to 25,000. And Jesus took the loaves. Uh, Mark's gospel tells us that he broke them. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. And the disciples, to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. And, And so... He, he used what this little boy offered, this bread and fish. But Jesus, note carefully, didn't work until the disciples realized that they didn't have what it took to minister to the people's needs. And Jesus took the loaves, five loaves of bread, two small fish, to minister to, to these 25,000 people or so. You see, he's pleased to use the small things, to use the weak things. And that way, he gets the glory. And perhaps the Lord Jesus wants to use you today as weak and as helpless as you are. But note carefully that it was only as those things were placed in the hands of Jesus that they became sufficient to meet the needs of the people. And Jesus gave thanks. He distributed them to the disciples. The disciples distributed them to those that were sitting there. And so the miracle of the multiplying took place in Jesus' hands. And I wondered, what's going through the minds of those disciples? We counted five fish or five loaves of bread and two fish, and he continues to just give it out to us. And now we're ha- He wanted them to see what he was doing. They had a bird's eye view of, of the miracle. They saw firsthand what happened. And, and any time we trust the Lord, we're going to see the same thing. Don't miss this. He fed the multitudes of hungry people through his disciples. Though he himself brought the increase, they distributed the food. You see, it's the privilege of every single child of God to pass on to others the things that God has done for us, to give away his grace, as it were. And we can't give out to others what we haven't, first of all, received from the Lord. That which he puts in our hands, we give it away. And so they were filled. The idea here is to the full, they were glutted. So the ply lasted as long as there was a demand. And I have to ask you the question, as I asked myself when I looked at this, how hungry are you for the things of God? You see, the supply lasted as long as there was a demand. And then at the end of verse 11, as much as they wanted. As long as there was a need, Jesus was using his disciples. It was just going right through their hands to meet the needs of the people around them. How much of what the Lord has to offer do you want? The supply is there. Is the demand, you see? John 6, 35 Jumping ahead a little bit, he said said to them, I'm the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Then he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up, verse 13, and filled 12 baskets of fragments of the five barley loaves that were left over 
uh, by those who had eaten. So not only were the disciples fed when they obeyed the Lord Jesus, but then there were 12 baskets of food left over. How many disciples are there? There's 12 of them, aren't there? Disciples had more than they had at the beginning, and so will you and I. You know, sometimes we're so stingy. We, I, it's, it's all I got. I'm not sure if I, if I can extend myself that way. And when we give to the Lord what we have in our hands for the Lord to use, he'll always uh, take care of our needs. And maybe we don't have much because we're not giving out much. We're not extending ourselves that way. But the disciples were enriched beyond what they gave. And of course, the Lord deserves everything we have. Not four loaves and one fish, but, but all of it, the five loaves and, and, and both fish. Not a 90% commitment, but an entire, complete 100% commitment. He wants all that we have and all that we are. And when we do that, he will use us to meet the needs of others. And there'll be plenty left over for us. And so another question arises in this. Have we placed ourselves and all that we have in his hands? Nothing holding back. And then those men, when they had seen the sign, the miracle that Jesus did, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Now that is their understanding from back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses speaking said, the Lord will raise to you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, and him shall you hear. And so they recognized that Jesus is probably that prophet, and they said to them, themselves, this is the one who Moses was talking about. He's doing miracles, but here's the thing. Jesus was, in fact, the prophet that Moses wrote about that was here, but don't forget that Moses also said, him you shall hear. But they weren't ready to listen. They loved being fed, they loved watching the miracles and having some a physician traveling with them the entire time, but they weren't really ready to hear what he had to say. And again, there are people like that, interested in Jesus for what he can do for them, but they're not really interested in what he has to say to them. Yes, he's the prophet. Yes, he speaks for God. But are you ready to hear him and obey him? That's the question. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that we're, they were about to come and take him by first force to make him a king, and no doubt for their own end, he departed again to a mountain by himself alone to pray. And so Jesus resists this, this uh, attempt on their part to take and make him a king. Why? Because they didn't have a clear understanding uh, of who it was. It wasn't the time for him to proclaim himself as, as the king because they were missing the entire point. He came to save them from their sins. And all they were concerned about was, was putting off the Roman yoke. Uh, they didn't want to be under the control of Rome any longer. And sometimes we're not, you know, seeing more of Jesus or having our needs met because we, we're, we're, you know, praying so we might consume it upon our own lust, just like he said. So they weren't ready. Another thought here is, you know, what do you do at the moment of the biggest temptation in your entire life? You know, you don't have to go through all of this, Jesus. We can make you a king right here and now. Why don't we do that? And so what does he do? He gets away to pray. What do you do when, when you're tempted? You know, Jesus is the one that said to his disciples, pray that you enter not into temptation. And uh, temptation is not sin, but when we enter into it, when we attach ourselves to it, uh, that's the problem. And now, beginning in verse 16, uh, he walks on the water. And when the evening had come, so it's still the same day, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Uh, Matthew tells us in his gospel that he sent the disciples away by boat to Capernaum, which is five or six miles uh, away by boat. And then Jesus sent the people away. And then he went up at that point into a mountain to pray. And it was now dark and Jesus had not come to them. And then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. It, it's another test, people. <laughs> it was dark and Jesus hadn't come. And now it's not only dark, but there's a great wind that's blowing. And they were being tossed about in the sea. And Jesus had not come yet. You know, I'm sure they're just like us, you know, that, 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 uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's getting dark. I, I hope he shows up, you know. You know I, want, I want to trust him, you know. 
and then now it's not only dark, and now the wind comes. Oh, great. Where is he? <laughs> and so they had rowed, when they had rowed about three or four miles, and Matthew tells us that by this time, it's now three or four o'clock in the morning, they've been rowing against the wind for eight hours, and they're only halfway across the Sea of Galilee, and it's not that big. At times, Jesus, having sent us off, it gets dark and the wind starts blowing and it seems that he's not going to come. It seems that he's not even aware of what we're going through. Do you know what I mean? And then he just waits. Doesn't that, does it ever bother you? I mean, it's nothing for you to come right now. But have you read Isaiah 30, verse 18? It says, therefore, the Lord will wait And then it says something so important, that he may be gracious to you. Well, what does that mean? Well, he's wanting to do something in you. He's wanting to be gracious to you. But if he just met the need the first moment you cried out, then you're not going to learn the things uh, that he wants to show you in his grace. The Lord waits. It's in the waiting that our faith is built up. It's in the waiting that we learn more about the grace. And that's why James said, count it all, brethren, joy, when you are counted all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. Don't fret in the middle of it, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so it's in the waiting. It's in that waiting room that our faith is completed. Like the feeding of the 5,000, the Lord wanted the disciples to know that he wanted them to come to the end of his, their own devices before he prided provided for them, and here he wants them to come to the end of their selves before he uh, delivers them. We, we call it wit's end. <laughs> then they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. Boy, wouldn't you be? But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Evidently, they had already forgotten the miracle feeding of the 5,000 just a few hours earlier. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. So Jesus performed another miracle just to get them to the land. You know, in in the Lord's own time, he does these things, and he knows the time he will deliver us. But he was totally aware of their situation. We actually went on one of our trips up to the place where Jesus would often go up to pray. And you know you have a bird's eye view of the entire lake from that place. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew how many hours he'd been there rowing. He's probably going, not quite yet, you know, just, just hang in there, you know. Totally aware. He had sent them into the storm. You think he didn't know the storm was coming? But remember, all the time he's praying and he's aware of it. And he wouldn't help them until they realized that that the help they needed uh, was outside of themselves. Remember, they're all experienced fishermen. They're probably fighting inside the boat. No, let me take over. You know, you take, no, this is the way we're to go. Let's go this way. No, let's throw the tackle out. No, you know. Trying to do it themselves. And and, 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 and he's just going, okay, I, I mean, I could have helped you three hours ago if you just let me, you know. They're seasoned fishermen. And even though it was dark, as far as the disciples were concerned, okay, he saw. You know, he doesn't always promise smooth sailing, does he? But he does promise a safe landing. His disciples are learning to trust him, and so are we. On the following day, verse 22, when the people saw, or who were standing on the other side of the sea, remember that multitude? They saw that there was no other boat there except that the one the disciples had entered to and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, the other boats came from Tiberias, that's in the south, near the place where they had eaten bread after the Lord had given thanks. And when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there or his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So, Uh, Come morning, seeing that Jesus was not there and knowing that the disciples had already gone to Capernaum and some of them got on the boats from where they were uh, to to, to follow him. Others were walking around the sea uh, following him on foot. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, where did you come from? Or, Or when did you come here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs or the miracles, notice carefully, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. 
Jesus knew that they weren't interested in the eternal things like salvation, eternal life, but only the temporal things like bread and fish. And then he says something so important. In verse 27, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures unto eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because the Father has set his seal on him. He's the one the Father's approved of. And so they were seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons, that they were physically hungry. And, 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 and when he used that term, the food that perishes, it's a, it's a tense that's it's, it's perishing even now as we speak. And many are laboring for and striving for and longing for the things that are presently perishing away, fading away, and not after the eternal things. Material things are like cotton candy. Oh, they're so sweet. It looks so good, doesn't it? And then, where'd it go? What happened? We've all been there. Man shall not live by bread alone, which is physical and temporary, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what's spiritual. That's eternal. And so they labored for that which is temporary. And he used the feeding of the 5,000, the hunger that was taken care of there, though it was a temporal thing, to teach them this important lesson. Don't labor for that. All, all your efforts and, are f- towards those things. Uh, did you know there's no such thing as a happy meal? Because you'd get hungry and it's... You know, and to these people who had fed with bread and fish, they were now hungry again. He said, labor not for that which perishes, but for the bread that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. It's a gift. Remember back to the woman at, at, at the well, he said, whoever drinks of the water, this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. And the, the point is that, that, that people, and these people were striving after that which is temporary, that which sustains their lives, but he came to offer them something that would sustain them eternally, his own life. And the best thing about it, they didn't have to work for it. And then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? The rich young ruler, what good thing must I do to obtain eternal life? For them, it was all about what they had to do. You know, they're they're somewhat getting what he's saying, but they still can't get past the fact, what do I have to do? What is it that you expect from me that you, in order that I might be saved? He, man is always occupied with trying to work for, trying to earn salvation. And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. You want to know what God requires? That you believe in him whom he sent. That, my friends, is the gospel. Well, he has reduced salvation to the lowest common denominator as far as our part's concerned. Can can you believe? Can you do that? (laughs) Well, it's pretty simple. How do we labor for, for that which endures to eternal life? Simply believe in the one that God sent. You see, the only work that God will accept for your salvation, for my salvation, is the work of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Nothing else will do. Now, let's apply this uh, this to ourselves here. Just like the disciples had to come to realize that their own resources were not enough. And just how they had to realize that even their own skill was not enough. They were skilled fishermen that they didn't have what it took to cross the Sea of Galilee, so too you and I must come to grips that we don't have what it takes to be saved. We don't have the skill. We don't have the cunning. We don't have the wisdom or the knowledge. We don't have the desire. We don't have the resources. And so both of these, the feeding of the 5,000, he brought them and reduced them down to where they were nothing, and they knew it to take care of the situation. And in, 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 in the boat, the same thing. Experienced fishermen, a dozen of them. And they still couldn't deliver themselves. And the picture here is that of salvation. But he can. How? By some great thing you do or some... some no, by your simple faith and trust in what his son did. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's not about what we need to do. It's about what God has done. Amen?
Let's pray. Lord, help us to get this into our heads and more importantly, into our hearts. To not labor for that which perishes, to trust you. You said that that you'll take care of every need that we have. Help us to trust you for that, God, and not not waste our lives on, on just those kinds of temporal, physical kinds of things, Lord, but help us to labor for the food that does not perish by simply believing in you. And Lord, you know who is here this morning who has never yet made, has not yet made that decision for Christ, who has not yet come to the realization or, or admitted that their resources are not enough to take care of their own salvation, that, that no matter how many buckets they have, they're never going to get all the water out of the boat. It's sinking. If that's you this morning, all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ to take your faith, what little faith you have, and place it not in your own efforts, but in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. It's sufficient. God sent him to do that. He did it. If that's you this morning, would you lift up your hand? Quit playing games with God. He's promised to give you eternal life if you will just believe in him, if you will just express your faith and trust in him. It's so simple. If you're here this morning and you are in some, you're already a believer, you're in some difficult situation, you're in the middle of the lake and you're looking around and Jesus is nowhere to be found. Please understand he's got his eye on you. He's aware of it. He knows himself what he will do even though he hasn't let you in on it. And he will bring you through. And it's in that time where we wait that, he's, that, that, that we learn of his grace, that he's gracious to us. And, and, and we, you know, on the other side of it, we'd never do anything different. We've learned so much. And if that's you, then, then you can reach out your hand to the Lord. He's there for you. He's so wonderful. He sees everything. He knows everything. And he's gracious enough and patient enough with us to allow us to go through some difficult situations that he might be gracious, more gracious to us. You know, we're not going to understand everything this side of eternity. It's going to, we're going to have to pass through that door to realize what he did and how he worked in our lives and the lives of those that we love. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that in the waiting and in the difficulties, God, that you show yourself strong in our behalf, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, God. Cause us to trust more and more every day in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand.